Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the restart of Digital Rebar Provision, meetup number 39. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some really cool shizzle. Uh, but in the meantime, I wanted to first say thank you to everyone who's joined. Uh, it's great to see some uh, old faces and some new faces here at meetup. Um, we're hoping as we move forward to have a lot more uh, community involvement. So this is a call to arms for all of you uh, in the meetup world. If you have something cool that you're doing with digital rebar provision, uh, integrating with infrastructure, uh, deploying DRP, cool content packs, whatever it happens to be that revolves around the sphere of digital rebar provision, we really would love your involvement. Uh, in the past, we've had some of our community uh, members do some presentations that were extremely well received and we'd love to make you all uh, famous and rich beyond your wildest uh, imagination by uh, joining us here and uh, getting your 15 seconds of fame, I mean 15 minutes of fame. Um, that being said, uh, myself, I'm Shane Gibson, uh, Solutions Architect for RackN. We have on the RackN team, uh, we have um, Michael Rice, Rob Hirschfeld, Greg Altos. I think Victor jumped in. Did Victor jump in? Victor jumped in with us and Isaac uh, Hirschfeld as well. So we have a fair uh, representation from the RackN team. Uh, and today, version 39, we're going to talk about uh, a couple of really cool things. Uh, Rob has been working on uh, getting the Ansible uh, play uh, stuff, whatever the hell it is that Ansible does. I don't know what Ansible does. <laughs> Nothing useful. But getting the Ansible stuff uh, in in shape and working, and he's going to show us uh, what he's been doing in that space and the integration with Digital Rebar Provision. Uh, Victor is going to talk about our Net Wrangler code and a little bit of the integration we did with the Net Wrangler tooling into DRP CLI. So there's some really cool uh, DRP CLI net commands that leverages and uses the Net Wrangler uh, tool itself. For those of you not familiar with Net Wrangler, uh, Net Wrangler is the open source piece that we released that's its own standalone uh, binary that's designed as a single shot uh, configuration tooling that uses the netplan.io, basically roughly speaking, uh, compatible uh, DSL to describe and define your network interfaces. So it's a really great tool for in infrastructure provisioning within the flow of digital rebar provision. <sighs> okay, deep breath. All of that said, um, we've got some new faces here. Uh, Clive, welcome. Um, I don't think we've seen you here before, so appreciate you joining and jumping in with us. Uh, Don, I don't recall if you've joined us before. I know you've been hanging around the community quite a bit. Um, but welcome and some old faces as well CJ and Chris trees uh, great to see you guys um, Hopefully you get a bunch of good information uh, if you have questions throughout the demos or presentations Please chime in and let us know uh, we like to be interactive uh, If the questions devolve into sort of deep discussions We might table those as a parking lot for the end of the meetup and we'll do a little if uh, we have a little bit of time on the end We'll do a little bit of office hours discussion there. Uh, so Victor, Rob, Shane, me, that's me. Uh, who's ready to go? Who wants to go first? I'm happy to jump done, in done. if people want to see it. All right, Rob, break the ice with Ansible. So I'll uh, toss it over to you. All right, let me find the right window to share. And uh, which is, I have a lot open, here we go. Uh, and I recorded a, uh, video. Actually, this demo is recorded as a video, so you can see what I did to prep for it, and then you can actually repeat it in slow motion. Of course, we're going to post this too. But I built a little three-node cluster. Uh, I'm not planning to use the UX much for this um, demo, so I'll, I'll show it here, and then we'll, we'll jump over to the, the CLI um, for the, the real piece of the demo, but I will do a little here. So I've got, um, I'm just using Amazon in this case, so you can run a digital rebar provision in Amazon. It's a super easy way to set things up, uh, especially if you want good fast internet access. Uh, but I, I have these three machines, any one of these machines, it's, I'm gonna show you, it, this is important. Um, in the Amazon, you can add a stage that collects cloud information. So one of the challenges with Amazon is that the machines addresses an internal address, which is appropriate, but then it then we create a property for an external address. So for me to run an Ansible playbook, Ansible's external to the system, 
um, I have to be able to use external IPs or accessible I IPs. And so uh, this will probably make even more sense with NetPlan as we go. But it's worth noting that that gets stuffed in here. Um, this is a completely fresh digital rebar install. Um, I've just got a couple of pieces into it. One, of the, I have put in my SSH key so that I can SSH into the boxes, another requirement for Ansible. And then I'll describe a little bit about how Ansible works um, uh, in, in our mapping. So this conversation came out of a couple of meetings we had months ago. We were talking about Ansible and the way we'd done Ansible. If those of you who go back to our Kube spray days, remember we built some really complex structures um, to map uh, rebar into Ansible. And with changes that we've been making to profiles and profile capabilities, all of that sort of became moot. So we could use profiles as groups. So the thing I'm gonna be doing here is I'm actually using, let me pull up the website uh, as an example. Here it is. This thing, uh, this, there's a light version of Kubernetes called K3S. It's not Kubernetes, it's a fork of Kubernetes and then a whole bunch of stuff was stripped out of it. Um, that's a whole nother conversation, but we could, we could literally make a, a variant of crib or extend crib to install K3S. And it has exactly the same APIs as Kubernetes. That's gonna, Shane, that would be a fun conversation for us to have in a future meetup. Um, Cause I know we need to spend more time with crib anyway. Um, but they have a very simple Ansible playbook, which is why I picked it. You have a master, you have nodes, and then you have a cluster with children, uh, which is very similar to Kubespray also. So everything I'm showing you could be applied to Kubespray. So to make this work, I need to create a master group, in this case, a profile. I don't need anything else in it. I need a node group, which is a profile for us. That's excellent, master node. And then I need to put the machines I have I have to apply those profiles to those machines. So this is exactly like what you would be doing if you were creating an inventory file, which is really what we're doing for Ansible. So we're not gonna create a, a, a YAML based any file like they normally do. We're gonna create a dynamic inventory generated straight from digital rebar. So in this case, what I've got is, uh, I wanna put pick node. So what, what I've done, Right now is, I'm just using the UX because I'm being a little lazy, but I've taken these nodes, I've put them in different uh, groups. I created some, some groups that, profiles that map to groups, and then I've put machines in those groups. Should be pretty straightforward. That's the last time I need to go into the UX for this demo. So let me figure out, uh, where did my, where's Zoom? And, cool. Now I'm switching over to my CLI. Is this the right CLI? Yes, it is. All right, can everybody see my CLI window? Yes, we can see that. So in this window, I've cloned that repo I showed you. Here's the K3S contrib repo, Ansible, which is good. Um, and I've done, there's a couple of things I need to do uh, to make all this stuff work. One of them that I've done is I've created a soft link to the DRP machines Python file. This file's in provision uh, integrations Ansible, and this is, this is what provides the API integration. So I could literally just run it. Um, in this case, to make it easier for development, I just, I'm just soft linking it from where I'm actually doing the development. Uh, and if I copy this out to JQ, this will not work, which is gonna be a useful test. Um, it's going to fail and JQ is going to be unhappy about the result um, because I haven't yet told it anything about my system. So let's do that. Um, so it's basically telling me, hey, I can't connect to all sorts of issues. No surprise, I have to export my endpoint. So just like you're used to doing uh, Rocket Skate's endpoints, uh, endpoint, you have to do exactly the same thing here. So this is assuming that your system is set up correctly for digital rebar and the, the DRP CLIs work. Uh, this does not use the DRP CLIs, um, but now I can test that everything's working using the CLI info get. So now when I run the same test, I'll be able to talk to the system and pull back. I'm just using default credentials. Uh, 
this JSON file. This JSON, this behemoth of a JSON file is what's required as input. Um, there's some extra stuff because every, every, every profile gets mapped over. But this is, this is the core thing of the demo. So that DRP Python file runs this list and is able to um, basically build the correct JSON file for you to create dynamic inventory. And what that means is there's a meta file that has all the host variables and the host variables identify um, things like which Ansible host you should use, the name of the machine. You can set additional values like your Ansible user. Um, all those things are described in the docs. And then the other thing you'll note is here's the group node and all. Um, both are required, you know, this node is gonna be required for the workflow we're gonna do. All is a default group. And then it lists the hosts. So from that perspective, I can then do something simple like Ansible, use the all group, I can use the inventory, and then I can just tell it to ping those boxes. Uh, I've done some work in the background to tell it accept certificates and things like that. Um, and so basically what's happening is when you provide this dash inventory, it's going to use that JSON file which dynamically pulls information out of digital rebar. So if you change machines profiles or add parameters, which translate as variables into that file, you are literally building everything any Ansible system needs to work. Um, and the profiles are a very good mapping to base groups with one exception. That one exception is um, the nested uh, digital rebar doesn't have nested profiles. We only have flat profiles. And so you need to provide a way to say this, this profile is a parent. And we have a syntax for that. It's very simple um, where you can say DRP profiles create, you name, the, you name the cluster and then you tell it there's an Ansible children and you name the children. Uh, so I have a command that does that. And when I do that, what you'll see when I look at my Ansible inventory now is that it's gonna create this K3S cluster and identify it as having children. Um, one of the nice things about this is that I could also um, add variables and all sorts of other information. You'll see I, I installed crib on this system. Um, so it also has all sorts of data. This is an exact mapping for what you need in Ansible. So it's really, really nice from that perspective. I keep saying that because it, it just turned out to be a very clean integration. Um, and then the proof is in the pudding. So if I say Ansible playbook, let's just do it from here. If I just switch it to an Ansible playbook and I tell it to use the site.yaml file that is provided in this Ansible playbook, uh, let's see. Oh, and provide the correct syntax. Um, literally, that DRP file is the inventory file that that site YAML needs. And this is enough for me to install K3S on those systems. Um, and that's it. So uh, there, there are some, this is a, you know, it's a open public file. There's probably optimizations and added features and things like that, but the basics are there. So, um, Pretty much any any playbook you need to build, it's all you have to do is map in some profiles. So it's fairly similar in terms of the path in, in getting uh, Ansible inventory just cleaned up and sort of more cleanly integrated within to DRP itself. Yeah. So the the nice thing is in the last version we did, you had to build all these structures and and they're very um, uh, bespoke for Ansible, and then they were very hard to maintain. In this case, if you're using DRP correctly and assigning profiles to machines, you're going to get natural behavior um, that maps directly into those profiles. Um, and there's some added features in here that, that are worth mentioning. Like you can assign a parameter to machines uh, to identify which machines get included. So you can actually filter your Ansible down into like sections or teams. Um, our multi-tenancy would apply here. So your user account, if it can't see machines, isn't going to get them on the list. Um, you know, there's a couple of nuances that, that we could play with. Um, I one, one, thing, one thing to note is right now it requires TIP. 
um, because the DRP inventory file uses one of the new uh, query parameters that we enabled, uh, the in query. So um, it could probably Tip be of digital rebar provision, right? Right. What will become version 3.14 in, in a couple of weeks. So um, just keep that in mind if you want to play with it. If you want to, it, it wouldn't be hard to remove that requirement um, and have it loop over the data it's got instead of making multiple API calls. So that's probably a reasonable optimization to see. Um, but yeah, that's it. Okay, excellent. Um, questions out to community, thoughts? Anybody out there using the Ansible stuff? Uh, what are your thoughts around this? Do, 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 do. <laughs> Do, 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 do. Nobody wants to I, talk. I will. So, I will. Go ahead. So is um, this combined hey, with the, the key management stuff, right? Uh, because that's Ooh. what, you know, when I was messing with Ansible, um, this is on a previous thing, but uh, I, in, you know, managing the SSH keys on the machines were always the issue. So if we used some of your other stuff to, you know, when we set up the machines, you know, when, like when you did the Amazon to, you know, initially grab those machines, then you could hand those keys off to the um, uh, playbook stuff. Is that right? Or yeah, literally. So in, in the case that I have here, when I created the Amazon, oh, you can't see it. Um, when I created the Amazon, I'll share again so you can see it in the UX. Um, so when I, when I created the, all I did was I created my key in the global profile and it was automatically applied. Um, and so when I create Amazon instances, uh, let me do a, do a, should be really fast. So I can create a new Amazon instance. And when I do that, I actually tell it proceed without a key pair. And I don't install, I don't let Amazon install my keys on these systems. Um, and it'll, it'll just go through the process. And then the workflow that we build for Amazon, um, which is really just discover, installs your SSH keys if they're available. Then it collects data about Amazon, installs the runner so you can reboot the systems and then waits. But yeah, key management's a big deal. I do know that um, we have a pull coming that Isaac just completed. Um, that lets you run Amazon in local mode and are uh, Ansible in local mode. And uh, when you do that, you don't need a key either. Right, then you're using the runner without uh, directly on the machines. So both external to DRP and internal to DRP options are available. That's, an, that's a future meetup topic. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thanks, Chris, I appreciate the questions and uh, anyone else in community? Any other thoughts or questions? Kind of weird having Chris with audio. Usually it's Chris and <laughs> chat window. And we, we we all forget to open the chat window and Chris is talking away in there and we're like, someone find, oh, Chris had questions. Sorry, Chris. <laughs> all right. Um, Victor. Yo. Are you ready to do some Net Wrangler and DRP CLI net magic, or you want me to roll next? No, I can go. All right, so Victor is um, one of our primary authors on, I don't know, did you write all of it, the Net Wrangler pieces? I think you wrote all of it, didn't you, Victor? I wrote all of it. Yeah, so all the, the Net Wrangler pieces, which were uh, released as the uh, Net Wrangler uh, component and you can find that at netwrangler.io. It's also on GitHub uh, under Bracken Net Wrangler or Digital Rebar. Anyways, the net plant, uh, netwrangler.io website has a pointer to the GitHub reference. So if you're interested in what is happening with Net Wrangler pieces there uh, as it's, it exists as a standalone component. Uh, and then Victor has been working on the integration of uh, use, using Net Wrangler uh, within the DRP CLI client to also do some in interesting extended functionality. And Victor, I will let you take it away from there. All right. So 
as I'm sure everyone who's used the digital, re digital rebar uh, before is aware, normally whenever you uh, normally whenever you are installing a system using digital rebar, unless you have a specialized task or uh, you know you write custom scripting, you're going to get uh, IP. You're you're going to essentially just get DHCP addresses on the node or on the interface that we booted from. So if we do like uh, on this VM, which I've just uh, threw CentOS on, you know, we've got two Ethernet devices. Uh, we booted off of VMP 3SO, so it has the address of record that we want. And CentOS, so by default, we got 16 on the uh, first, inter first Ethernet interface, which is the one I'm currently SSH to, and we also got 22 on the second one, because uh, both of these are connected to the same bridge and sent to us by default uh, DHCP is on all of them. But suppose we want something a little more ornate. Suppose we want to bond these two interfaces. With the uh, latest tip code for the digital, for the content and for DR provision itself, we have a couple of new, uh, we have a new command to play around with in Dirt CLI, and we have a couple of new parameters to mess around with it. Uh, so I've gone ahead and created a profile. And what this profile is going to do is it is going to take all of the Ethernet, all of the uh, Ethernet devices on uh, KVM VMs like this, they all count as PCI devices. There's no, there's nothing that counts as an integrated device. And I'm going to bond them all together into a bond named Brondo. And I'm going to tell Brondo that it should get its address from DHCP. We got this set up in a spicky little profile. And so if we go back to machines, let's add this profile. And set it to the stage that I've got set up to do run network configuration. All right. And so if we go back through the job for that, we went ahead and we ran a we ran a new command called derp CLI net autogen. And what that command does is it pulls down the contents of the net slash interface config, which defines uh, what interfaces should have what type of address configuration, and the net uh, interface topology param, which defines how the interfaces should be bonded or bridged or VLAN together and basically any combination of all of those in order to create the topology that we want on the system with the final network configuration that we want. So right now, that stage that I just ran, all it did was write out the configuration file. And if we look in, we see that we have uh, if CFG files for the first Ethernet address or the first Ethernet uh, device, the second Ethernet device, and our bridge, but it's not active yet mostly because these stages are designed to run during the OS install process. So I'm going to go ahead and reboot it, because if I tried to change the config on the fly, I'd lose my connection. And this should come back pretty quickly. Now, you can see that we have our new Rondo bond interface, which has bonded together these two Ethernet devices. And it has acquired, it has acquired its IP address via DHCP.
Any questions so far? So the two primary pieces, Victor, we're using on the BRP side is your net interface config and then the topology, which defines your overall components. And then that topology structure is what maps to the net plan IO syntax, basically. Yep. And uh, we, go ahead. Just drag this out here so we can look at them side by side. So you can see that uh, the interface topology is pretty much a direct one-to-one -one map for what is in a net plan. This is just a, one, of the, one of the simple example ones that they have on the netplan.io website. And yep. the only thing that is missing out of here is we don't have addresses, gateway, or name servers defined in here um, because the actual addressing component is handled by the net interface config. Um, the reasoning for this split is so that we can uh, define, you know, a set of topologies that will be used across, um, you know, multiple different machines. <clears throat> and then on each individual machine. Define what the addressing for that machine will be. Yeah. Yeah. If it's something besides <laughs> TCP, you can, uh, you can define what uh, what addresses what addresses uh, the interfaces should have uh, you know the gateways they should use the name servers all, the, all that other fun stuff. Yeah, and can you in your uh, web browser, Victor, would you please bring up uh, netwrangler.io? Sure. And so the netwrangler, there's the link to the GitHub up there. Um, and there's a lot of intro info here on NetWrangler in general, but also if you would follow through to the GitHub link, please. Uh, okay. uh, one of the things that we also have, uh, Victor has uh, studiously collected a number of examples in the GitHub page, it, which is the test data. And then each of these directories is a uh, number of samples for the NetPlan YAML. Uh, syntax that can give you a good starting point on how to get started with Net Wrangler uh, with specific topology types and configuration types. Uh, obviously, as uh, Victor was saying, there's the split between the NetPlan IO combined uh, network config and topology pieces uh, on the DRP CLI side. We've split those out. Um, so there's a little bit of mapping work you'd have to do there to make that split uh, useful. Um, but the integration uh, is really nice between NetWrangler and DRP CLI. Um, is there anything else you wanted to show on that, uh, Victor? Yeah, so the command that we use to run it is part of the DRP CLI net set series of commands. And we have three of those right now. We have uh, FIS, which grabs the current physical uh, interfaces on the system. Um, we have compile and generate, which uh, essentially are a more direct interface into what uh, NetWrangler does. And then we have autogen, which um, is what pulls in the, the net interface config and net interface topology commands and uh, applies them to the current system and automatically figures out uh, what the format for the network configuration should be on the system. Uh, right now, the three uh, kind of distro specific formats that we support are uh, old school uh, Red Hat style network configuration via Etsy sysconfig. Uh, we, also, we also support uh, systemd uh, networkd to directly interface with uh, systemd as it seems to be the up and coming standard for configuring networks on systems. Uh, and we also support uh, using uh, NetPlan directly on uh, on Ubuntu, on current Ubuntu systems that uh, use it. So what we can do is we can actually take the network interface config and network interface topology parameters and directly compile those to NetPlan that is specific for the system. Uh, the reason that we, oh, 
ah, I wish this would just link directly to the one I'm interested in when I do that. Hey, Rob, can you get Isaac to fix that? Sorry, can you repeat? Uh, well, when I was in my profile and I clicked on the name of the, um, when I was in my profile and I clicked on the name of the parameter, I got that instead of it going directly. That is already If it was merged, it's on tip. Okay, well, it's it's not showing up in portal.rackin.io yet, so. Yeah. Yep. If I will we fix a, it. We have a couple of things coming that'll can that'll show up in Portal. Pretty soon, I suspect. Yep. <sighs> yeah. I, I have a question about mm -hmm. uh, I, I missed the beginning. Hey, Hello, guys. So, sorry, I'm late. Welcome. It's kind of dark yet. Good evening. <laughs> Good morning. Good uh, morning. Six thirty a.m. There, right? Oh. Yes. Yep. Oh my. <laughs> Nearly coffee time. So. So I've done this the hard way uh, because I couldn't figure it out in a short period of time. And I'm, I'm going to go back and watch your recording. But what I've done basically in a, in a workflow is I've, I've templated the Red Hat style interface config and just splattered that over the top of the DHCP config that, ha that gets applied automatically when I build my machine. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had some trouble when I restarted the network stack during a workflow. Uh, and I don't know, I, I didn't get down to whether it was DRP didn't like it or Kubernetes didn't like it, but I, I ended up leaving that step right towards the end. Uh, okay. is, is this, well, you, you didn't do it. You didn't restart the network stack live because you said you would have lost access to the machine. Is there a mechanism to, to do a restart of network, but not lose your management connection by DRP so you can keep running in the same workflow? That depends entirely on the underlying tooling that you're using. I mean, if you're just using the old school uh, rel style scripts, uh, when you restart the network, it literally tears everything down, uh, kills SSH, and then brings everything back up again. So you lose any connections. Right. Um, I don't know of any stacks by default that try to preserve connectivity when you tell them to restart the network. Um, and since this particular uh, setup is designed to uh, operate as part of the OS install process, I didn't go to any great links to harden um, applying configs or harden uh, derp CLI against uh, you know losing and potentially changing its IP address in the middle of running a task. Oh, so look, I missed that. How does it work as part of the OS install? Because in, in Red Hat land, you're running everything off a of kickstart. So, uh, our default kickstart fire up a runner and we run tasks in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so let me let me just show you that. Let me show you what that works, what that looks like real quick. Uh, let's see, machines. And I gotta do that. All right, so we've got this here thingamabob. And if I go to the CentOS 7 install workflow, this is gonna actually reinstall CentOS 7. But uh, so one of the things we do is we arrange for a runner to get fired up as part of the install. And currently with the latest uh, tip content, it has the configure network task as part of uh, that install. Ah, slick. Okay, that's great. So by default, uh, configure network, uh, the parameters themselves are set up so that it just configures the first uh, the interface that it booted off of for DHCP. Yep. And just goes at it that way because that's you know the expected default behavior but when, when it gets to that point you can write out whatever network configuration you want and when the system reboots into the final install it'll configure the network interfaces appropriately okay that's great my, my yeah my use case has been it's fine to have the machine install itself by dhcp or pixie but long term i want it to be statically addressed i don't care if it's the same ip address but i'm looking for the easiest mechanism to to make it static after an installation yeah and i'm trying to think of good ways to do that um <laughs> frankly i mean the the last piece that i haven't implemented is a piece that allows you to uh say uh get the address information from uh something related to the current machine either be it a subnet or uh, be it the address or the lease that it already has or go look it up in uh whatever ipam you're using or something along those lines um yeah. 
Well, frankly, for, frankly, for some of that, you know, it'd be best to work out what needs to happen with someone who actually uh, is using this stuff, who actually wants to use this in the field. Mm. My, yeah, so I don't know about other guys. My use case would be I, I create a reservation based on the MAC address. So I know what I want the machine to be addressed as. Okay. Uh, and if there was a flag that I could turn on to say, on installation, use my assigned address to make it static, that would be the winner. Okay. Um, are you using us for DHCP management or yes. something else? Okay. Uh, yeah. well, I, I start, in fact, I start with Ansible. I start with, and I'm sorry, I missed that piece as well. I start with a um, uh, host inventory. Uh, and for each host, I assign an IP and a Mac. And then I split that into DRP uh, as a bunch of reservations and machines. Then I boot the machines. Okay. We should talk more offline about this then. Okay. And then there is also, if you're using uh, DHCP from uh, digital rebar provision, uh, the DHCP can convert it to a reservation uh, very easily. There's a FAC article uh, for converting your existing lease to a reservation. Okay. Um, and it's a single call. Um, I was just looking for it for you. It's in the FAC somewhere, I believe. So. You can see that in the um, UX in the portal under the, I think it's under the reservations I'm looking right now, uh, under leases, I guess. Under leases, you select it and then click reserve. That makes the API call on the back end. So you can run your developer tools to see what's happening on the back end there as well. And there's a DRP CLI call that takes an existing lease, converts that to a reservation. Right, cool. I yeah. Turns out that so, I'm skipping that and I'm, I'm, I'm making the lease and the reservation. No, sorry, I'm ignoring the lease. That's right. I'm just making the reservation straight away because there, there's no, there are no unknowns. Um, all the Macs are understood. Um, so we go straight to reservation. And it seems to be what happens is when a machine with a reservation boots, a lease gets created. Okay. That's where I, I think we'll definitely want to talk on what's happening there. We'll talk through that flow. Okay. And we'll take a look at that. Peace. Awesome. Thanks for the input, David. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, Victor, anything else? Uh, that's pretty much it. I'm open for more general questions at this point. Cool. Any other questions from the peanut gallery? Nope. Okay. Going once, going twice. Sold. So the next piece we're going to talk about is the install.shell script, not a particularly sexy piece of code. Uh, does the job, gets DRP installed, but recently we've added some really interesting features to it that help, uh, particularly in environments where you're automating the deployment of DRP itself, and you want to very quickly set up and tear down DRP instances. So we have seen a number of customers that have both a much more infrastructure as code uh, CICD sort of pipeline. They want to be able to do more advanced uh, deployments of DRP itself. We're also um, working more towards uh, being able to spin up DRP instances in cloud environments and you want to just quickly hydrate a DRP instance with a given configuration and also doing some hardening aspects of it where you want to strip out uh, the default user credentials and inject your own credentials. So install that shell itself has quietly been growing some features and capabilities. A lot of those features and capabilities uh, actually go hand in hand with uh, some of our more advanced components, our en uh, endpoint manager plugin, uh, which is our single pane of glass for a federated control uh, master of multiple DRP endpoint, uh, either high availability clusters or individual endpoints. And so in a lot of those cases, spinning up uh, DRP endpoints and bringing them under control of the endpoint manager plugin uh, is needs to be a little bit better automated. And so these, so some of these pieces that we're going to talk about uh, help with that process, but also uh, a number of people don't even are, aren't aware of some of the basic things that we can do. So I thought I'd start with just a real fast overview of the install that shell basics, and then we'll step into some of the more advanced pieces. Uh, let me see if I can get my screen share going here. There we go. All right, so I have a single 
uh, machine here, just uh, called installer.0. And the basic process that we outline in our sort of uh, get started fast is uh, spell curl correctly, uh, uh, minus s get rebar.digital to get the actual script. And we support two uh, installer scripts, the stable version and the tip version, just like all of our other versioning schemes. So you can specify to get the stable version uh, or you can specify to get the tip version. And that's the actual install shell script itself. And typically we tell you to pass it to bash minus s and do something. In this case, let's just go ahead and pipe it to get help. And so we then get our useful help output. And as you can see here, We've done, I think, a fairly decent job in documenting uh, the installer itself. So if you're ever confused about exactly what you want to apply, run the help. All right, so the next step is instead of actually passing it, let's save it as install.shell and uh, mod 755 install.shell so we don't have to keep passing it. And then we run install.shell uh, and it tells us, hey, you need to do something interesting. Tell me what to do. So typically, a lot of times, um, we refer to the isolated mode. And the isolated mode is basically a setup DRP in my current working directory. Uh, the isolated mode kind of poops <laughs> stuff all over the place. So typically, we recommend making a directory like DRP, CD to DRP, run in the installer uh, with isolated mode. And then this is going to actually require that I say install in isolated mode. So um, get a little bit of help feedback on what we want to do. The first thing we do is we make sure a couple of the specific dependencies that we need are in place. So 7-zip, BSD, tar, uh, I think that's it. Is there a third one? I forget. I think we cleaned that up. But uh, we make sure the dependencies are in place on the machine, and then we download the drprovision.zip. As you see, that has flown by. Uh, the drprovision.zip binary and the SHA sum for it, we explode it out in our current directory. This is where it makes the mess all over everything. In the isolated mode, it actually installs the stuff that's important in the DRP data directory. Right now, this is a, a naked DRP instance that hasn't started up, hasn't initialized. There's not much in there. Uh, this will correlate to the slash var slash lib slash dr dash provision production install mode. So if you do not specify uh, the isolated mode and you just do a straight install, it'll install the var lib dr provision. And then we'll start talking about some more of the interesting stuff. So we're going to just blow away that install mode. And we're going to do a production install mode. Uh, but we're going to say, I want version equals tip. So we can specify which specific version of DRP to install. And we support the verbs uh, stable and tip, and then a specific version like v3.13.0. And that's sort of outlined in the help for you if you need a, um, if you need a um, reminder. Uh, we always check for the dependencies. So if you don't actually want to go through the dependency check, particularly if you know you've, you're doing an upgrade and you've already done the dependency check, you can say skip uh, prereqs. So that is a nice piece when you're particularly in an isolated or air gap mode. We don't try and do any prerequisite testing. Uh, in this case, though, we've uh, done the all the install bits, and just to show uh, var lib dr provision, uh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> nice when you have a demo go go wrong on you. I don't think I've ever had this go wrong on me before. Do, do, do. Install version tip should be working. Yeah, <laughs> it works. Yep. What's your What's your problem? It's now you can copy the commands and go. There, we didn't install. Oh, probably because you already have the isolate. You already set up the uh, the isolated version. Delete the DRP subdirectory. Yeah. 
I did. It's gone. Oh, sorry, I wasn't yeah. paying close enough attention. I know. Uh, Right. Install version tip, right? Here, I'll just do install, right? And of course, I keep referencing the wrong installer. Downloading, yeah, okay, great. Do, 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 do. I just ran this. Okay, well, trust me that it'll work when we figure out <laughs> what bug I just introduced. And okay, you someone introduced. An, you already have an existing assets file. It's worried about over, overriding it as the warning it's, it's given you. you no, know, that I know that's that's the okay. startup. Oh, this is new. Uh, this is the new system. Some of the new system D stuff. Uh, all right, well, we'll debug that and we'll just continue on the mm -hmm. tutorial pretending like it all magically is working the way it always has in the past until today, until demo land. Uh, so one of the other things, uh, let's do the uh, dash help. Some of the things I wanted to point out uh, in the advanced feature pieces on the install is um, we've got our basics and we're pretending like it's running, but uh, some of the basics that are important is um, uh, oh, here we go. The zip file. So if you're doing an install from uh, in an offline or an isolated or air gapped environment, then you will want to specify the zip file as you bring it into that environment. So you can specify installation off the local zip file as opposed to the uh, download it from the website. And so that is one option that gives you um, yeah, I didn't that sacrifice the demo to the goat, uh, goat to the demo gods. Yeah, that was my problem. Um, and so you can then specify the zip file that you do locally. Uh, it's also uh, good for the air gap mode. Uh, as I mentioned, if you're doing an upgrade, uh, the upgrade process will also try and do a prereq check. So if you're in an air gap environment or you're doing an upgrade, you want to skip the prereqs checks. And, but you have to make sure that the BSD tar and the libs uh, seven zip pieces are installed and you'll see those are documented here, uh, right? We added curl and JQ to the list now. So seven zip curl JQ and BSD tar are the four requirements you want to have in place in the system. If you're doing a skip prereqs install, otherwise that'll cause you a little grief down the road. Um, there's a sort of, uh, Experimental piece, the fast downloader uses this ARIA 2 piece. So if you want to install ISOs during the install process, it can use ARIA 2 to do multiple repos to do a fast download process. Some of the uh, public mirrors are extremely slow and sometimes they get really slow. Uh, the ARIA 2 process uh, distributes in uh, chunks from multiple mirror locations and does a really nice job. Um, I say it's still experimental because it doesn't get a whole lot of love and testing as we update things. So if you try and run it um, and it breaks, let me know because I, ha I hacked that in there. Um, the other piece is if you want to keep around all of the installer bits, particularly in a production mode, uh, we're going to blow things out into a slash temp directory and then do the install from those pieces. Uh, you might want to keep the installer around and also you might want to keep the installer around if you want to do an uninstall on the system later, uh, the keep installer process will copy the install.shell script to uh, us or local bin uh, drp installer.shell by default. We rename it from install.shell because that's a bit generic. And someone coming in looking at it going, What the heck does this do? Install.shell. So drp installer.shell is what it gets renamed to. Okay, now we're going to get to the, the fun advanced sauce stuff. And I'm going to go fast because I'm running the clock down here. Uh, startup will try and actually uh, execute the appropriate start scripts to fire up DRP uh, after install. So in the past, we didn't do this. We let you do this. Um, but now you can specify if you want the startup process to install. Uh, we try and do the right thing based on the detected uh, startup process. So system D, system five, uh, upstart, the various um, pieces that we support. Uh, in addition, we have additional support for system D. So if you do the system D 
uh, flag that will actually start up, enable, and install unit files specifically. And it also unlocks and enables some more adv interesting advanced piece for scripting, which it is particularly remove the default RocketScape account and plumb in your own DRP user and password as the default on startup so you don't fire up a DRP instance that has default credentials in it. So that gives you a much better security path uh, going forward to maybe meet your environment requirements for user and passwords and not exposing default username and passwords. Good policy to have in place. The final two pieces that are really important, uh, particularly for uh, more advanced environments, is DRP ID defines the endpoint ID. So if you are copying a lot of the underlying backing store information for DRP, embedded within that is an, an ID instance that refers to DRP itself. It's a unique ID for DRP and its name, basically. You need to rename that instance when you basically make a clone or a copy of it somewhere else. So this tells it what to wire the new DRP ID instance as. And if you're running an HA pair, we can define what your HA pair uh, ID is, so what the cluster name is. Uh, so that's sort of it in a, a real fast nutshell. Uh, the demo gods were not kind. I have to go figure out what the heck um, went wrong there. Uh, but in any case, uh, that's a real fast rundown on the installer. All of these pieces are designed to help enhance your automation process and integration with some of the more advanced things uh, like DRP ID for rolling out um, multiple copies of DRP. Uh, we have some other uh, tooling processes where we can create a a single massive tarball that contains all of the components, configuration aspects, and elements of DRP itself with a front-end script that installs DRP and basically rehydrates all of DRP with a very uh, custom configuration for uh, environment. So if you're interested in some of those components, talk to us uh, in the Pound Community Channel on what we're doing there. There's some interesting aspects there. Um, Running out of time here, uh, but want to fire up um, and see if um, you, any questions from community on the installer uh, piece. If not, we'll uh, de devote the last couple of minutes to general questions. So first, any questions on the install piece? Besides the obvious, why did it break? Don't ask me right now. <laughs> At some point, okay. we should, we should, there's, we did a talk about the new catalog features and we probably need to revisit those because that's always a. Yep. The next, so, the next well, and the catalog features are, are exactly are, are a good, the next sort of logical step for automating the DRP bring up process and pulling in uh, content um, plugins and content packs. And so the catalog really enhances and is complementary to the install process for an automated uh, CI CD or however you're rolling your automation deployment of digital rebar provision itself. I have a question about install.sh. Fire away. Uh, what, what's this most streamlined way to make sure I have the latest version of DRP? So what I mean by that is uh, mm. if I just, if I'm, if I'm running, and I, did, I run install sh again, it's going to complain and say, no, I can't because DRP is currently running. Uh, is there a flag yeah, that so upgrade me, uh, automatically restart me if there's a new version that you're ready to apply? Okay, so now you're talking about some other fun uh, stuff that <clears throat> we've wired in. DRP has uh, grown its ability to uh, self-install itself. And so from the catalog, you'll actually see a, a, a digital rebar provision uh, element in the catalog and you can do an upgrade from the catalog and there's associated calls that go along with that and there's a bunch of tooling that goes around being able to restart the process because you have a running process if you copy over the running process off the file you, you create problems right within uh, the Linux uh, kernel space uh, so uh, we have some work that's gone on there if you're just doing a standard uh, upgrade in place you do need to stop uh, DRP first. So you have to kill DRP first, then run with the uh, upgrade command. And the upgrade command will preserve all of your existing environment and allow you to install over the top of the existing uh, signature files. So if you run install, the install checks for some signature files and won't let you install if it's already been installed in that environment. It's a safety check. But if you know what you're doing, you say upgrade, 
and then it'll install over the top of an existing environment, still preserving your previous configuration though. So a traditional just shell path is kill DRP. You can run the skip prereqs uh, and then you can say upgrade and then you can specify the version. So version equals stable, version equals tip, version equals, oh, you guys can, I, <laughs> I'm demonstrating all of this on my terminal, which I had already stopped sharing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyways, uh, everything I say still applies. This, the, there's nothing behind it, but you can specify a version, uh, dash for dash version equals stable tip, et cetera. That makes you sense. Also, you can also scan the catalog, depending on how you want to trigger when that happens. You can you can look at the catalog for hash changes and things like that too. Okay. Catalogs, so catalogs are a really powerful feature if you want to pull things out of the catalog. It's super super useful like that. Even down to upgrading the system itself. So basically, what we're saying is there's two ways to uh, to perform an upgrade. One is the, the classic way where I will stop the process and run install sh dash dash upgrade and then start the process. Yep. The other one, yep. which I'm not really sure I understand is what Rob just said is that we can use DRP itself to, to upgrade its own binary while it's running. Yes, so there's a process within the portal that correctly um, attempts to do an in-place upgrade of DRP itself, of a running DRP instance. And so we haven't fully finished sort of the command line way of doing that smoothly. So that'll be coming out as we get to that. Uh, but the portal itself will attempt to do, when you go to the, the catalog and you see digital rebar provision, select the version from there and it'll do an in-place upgrade. Yeah. Cool. And that will do it with a running instance. Yeah, Shane, Shane's right to, to say caveats. There's, it's really part of a much larger demo that we need to do about multi-site management. Yeah, it's it, it. But you can imagine the value of the feature where you're managing multiple sites and there's and what we've been building synchronizes uh, deployments, not just of DRP, but all the content yeah. or, and configurations across multiple sites. Okay, thank you. It's cool. Big stuff coming. Okay, excellent. We are at the end of our hour here and we've already lost a few people because uh, they have other things to do. Uh, in the meantime, uh, two weeks from today, whatever day that happens to be, I'm not going to do the math because I've been failing miserably today in my uh, demonstrations here. Uh, so two weeks from today, same time, same channel. Uh, there we go, the 30th, thank you. Um, 16 plus uh, 14 is beyond my uh, ability uh, to safely uh, calculate right now. Uh, so the 30th, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, uh, we'll be back here again. We have a lot of topics. We haven't set uh, exactly what we're going to cover, uh, but we have an awfully long list of agenda items, including things like filters and searching, catalog enhancements, and how the catalog really uh, expands and uh, creates a lot of incredible power to automation of a digital rebar managed environments, uh, role-based access controls, and portal tenant custom tenant views, uh, multi-site manager itself. Uh, we also refer to it as the endpoint manager plugin, which is that federated single pane of glass where we can push down and enforce configuration down through a hierarchy of DRP endpoints. Um, we have a callback, generic callback API we'll be talking about for integration with infrastructure pieces. <clears throat> ESXi, we've done a, a huge amount of work around VMware and ESXi. Uh, we have a coming uh, Python-based agent piece also Though instead of the Golang compiled version, since uh, ESXi is an appliance device, uh, Crib has seen a huge amount of enhancements as well. In fact, uh, due in large part to uh, David on the, the line with us here. So we're hoping that maybe he'll uh, be a, a willing to show us up, off some of the really cool work he's been doing there. Terraform is looking to get some huge upgrades and updates down the road as well. There's also a lot of caveats around the existing Terraform environment. We get questions around uh, scale testing. So we'd like to start exposing some of the work we'll be doing around scale testing of DRP with thousands of machines under control. Uh, auto boot target stuff, uh, uh, the list goes on. So we've got a, a great uh, we have a universal workflow. Silly. 
it's got a universal workflow. It's getting silly here. All right, we're, we we're getting have, silly. We have, we have universal a, a workflow to, is awesome. It's a lot to show off. We'll start. I'm, I'm trying to catch catch up and do videos and post them and then we let more time for discussion come in the chat in, in these meetings. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Appreciate your time. That wraps up Digital Rebar Provision Meetup 39. We'll see you at Meetup 40 in two weeks on the 30th.